Hi, and welcome to Mrs. PM Reads. Today, we are continuing in our story, The Help, by Catherine Stockett. And we will be in chapter 27 from Miss Skeeter's point of view. Last chapter, 26, we finally heard Minnie confess to Miss Celia about that pie. <laughs> Chapter 27 is very long and we're going to end up breaking that up into three different videos. So let's go ahead and get started. I stare at the phone in the kitchen. Remember, this is Skeeter. No one's called here in so long. It's like a dead thing mounted to the wall. There's a terrible quiet looming everywhere, at the library, at the drugstore, where I pick up mother's medicine, on High Street, where I buy typewriter ink, in our house. Now, let me move this a little closer because the light's better. Better. In our house. Oh, this is why. 1963. President Kennedy's assassination less than two weeks ago has struck the world dumb. It's like no one wants to be the first to break the silence. Nothing seems important enough. On the rare occasion that the phone does ring lately, it's Dr. Neal calling with more bad test results or a relative checking on mother. And yet, I still think Stuart sometimes, even though it's been five months since he called, even though I finally broke down and told mother we'd broken up. Mother looked shocked as I suspected she would, but thankfully just sighed. I take a deep breath, dial zero, and close myself up in the pantry. I tell the local operator the long distance number and wait. Harper and Rowe Publishers, how may I connect you? Elaine Stein's office, please. I wait for her secretary to come on the line, wishing I'd done this earlier. But it felt wrong to call the week of Kennedy's death. And I heard on the news, most offices were closed. Then it was Thanksgiving week. And when I called, the switchboard told me no one was answering in her office at all. So now I'm calling more than a week later than I'd planned. Elaine Stein, I blink, surprised it's not her secretary. Mrs. Stein, I'm sorry, this is Eugenia Phelan in Jackson, Mississippi. Yes, Eugenia, she sighs, evidently irritated that she took the chance to answer her own phone. I was calling to let you know that the manuscript will be ready right after the new year. I'll be mailing it to you the second week of January. I smile, having delivered my rehearsed lines perfectly. There is silence, except for an exhale of cigarette smoke. I shift on the flower can. I'm the one writing about the colored women in Mississippi? Yes, I remember, she says, but I can't tell if she really does. But then she says, you're the one who applied for the senior position. How is that project going? It's almost finished. We just have two more interviews to complete. And I was wondering if I should send it directly to your attention or to your secretary. Oh no, January is not acceptable. Eugenia. Are you in the house? I hear my mother call. I cover the phone. Just a minute, Mama. I call back, knowing if I don't, she'll barge in here. The last editor's meeting of the year is on December 21st, Mrs. Stein continues. If you want a chance at getting this read, I've got to have it in my hands by then. Otherwise, it goes in the pile. You don't want to be in the pile, Miss Phelan. But you told me January. 
Today is December 2nd. That only gives me 19 days to finish the entire thing. December 21st is when everyone leaves for vacation. And then in the new year, we're deluged with projects from our own list of authors and journalists. If you're a nobody, as you are, Miss Phelan, before the 21st is your window, your only window. I swallow. I don't know if, by the way, was that your mother you were speaking to? Do you still live at home? I try to think of a lie. She's just visiting. She's sick. She's passing through. Because I don't want Mrs. Stein to know that I've done nothing with my life. But then I sigh. Yes, I still live at home. And the Negro woman who raised you? I'm assuming she's still there? No, she's gone. Hmm, too bad. Do you know what happened to her? It just occurred to me, you'll need a section about your own maid. I close my eyes, fighting frustration. I don't know, honestly. Well, find out and definitely get that in. It'll add something personal to all of this. Yes, ma'am, I say, even though I have no idea how I'll finish two maids in time, much less write stories about Constantine. Just the thought of writing about her makes me wish deeply that she was here now. Goodbye, Miss Phelan. I hope you make the deadline, she says, before she hangs up. She mutters, and for God's sake, you're a 24-year-old educated woman. Get an apartment. I get off the phone, stunned by the news of the deadline and Mrs. Stein's insistence to get Constantine in the book. I know I need to get to work immediately, but I check on mother in her bedroom. In the past three months, her ulcers have gotten much worse. She's lost more weight and can't get through two days without vomiting. Even Dr. Neal looked surprised when I brought her in for her appointment last week. Mother eyes me up and down from her bed. Don't you have bridge club today? It's canceled. Elizabeth's baby is colicky, I lie. So many lies have been told. The room is thick with them. How are you feeling, I ask. The old white enamel bowl is next to her bed. Have you been sick? I'm fine. Don't wrinkle your forehead like that, Eugenia. It's not good for your complexion. Mother still doesn't know that I've been kicked out of Bridge Club or that Patsy Joyner got a new tennis partner. I don't get invited to cocktail parties or baby showers anymore or any functions where Hilly will be there. Except the league. At meetings, girls are short, to the point with me, when discussing newsletter business. I try to convince myself I don't care. I fix myself at my typewriter and don't leave most days. I tell myself that what you get when you put 31 to toilets on the most popular girl's front yard, people tend to treat you a little differently than before. It was almost four months ago that the door was sealed shut between Hilly and me, a door made of ice so thick it would take a hundred Mississippi summers to melt it. It's not as if I hadn't expected consequences. I just hadn't thought they'd last so long. Hilly's voice over the phone was gravelly sounding, low, like she'd been yelling all morning. You are sick, she hissed at me. Do not speak to me. Do not look at me. Do not say hello to my children. Technically, it was a typo, Hilly, was all I could think to say. I am going over to Senator Whitworth's house myself and telling him you, Skeeter Phelan, will be a blight on his campaign in Washington, a wart on the face of his re reputation, if Stewart ever associates with you again. I cringe at the mention of his name, even though we'd been broken up for weeks by then. I could imagine him looking away, 
not caring what I did anymore. You turned my yard into some kind of, of sideshow, Hilly said. Just how long have you been planning to humiliate my family? What Hilly didn't understand was I hadn't planned it at all. When I started typing out her bathroom initiative for the newsletter, typing words like disease and protect yourself and you're welcome, it was like something cracked open inside of me, not unlike a watermelon, cool and soothing and sweet. I always thought insanity would be a dark, bitter feeling, but it is drenching and delicious if you really roll around in it. I'd paid Pascagoula's brothers $25 each to put those junkyard pots onto Hilly's lawn, and they were scared but willing to do it. I remember how dark the night had been. I remember feeling lucky that some old building had been gutted and there were so many toilets at the junkyard to choose from. Twice I've dreamed I was back there doing it again. I don't regret it, but I don't feel quite as lucky anymore. And you call yourself a Christian, was Hilly's final words to me. And I thought, God, when did I ever do that? This November, Stooley Whitworth won the senator's race for Washington, but William Holbrook lost the local election to take his seat at the Senate. I'm quite sure Hilly blames me for this too. Not to mention all that work she put into setting me up with Stuart was for nothing. A few hours after talking to Mrs. Stein over the phone, I tiptoed back on to check on mother one last time. Daddy's already asleep beside her. Mother has a glass of milk on the table. She's propped up on her pillows, but her eyes are closed. She opens them as I peek in. Can I get you anything, Mama? I'm only resting because Dr. Neal told me to. Where are you going, Eugenia? It's nearly seven o'clock. I'll be back in a little while. I'm just going for a drive. I give her a kiss, hoping she doesn't ask any more questions. When I close the door, she's already fallen asleep. I drive fast through town. I dread telling Abilene about the new deadline. The old truck rattles and bangs in the potholes. It's in fast decline after another hard cotton season. My head practically hits the ceiling because someone's retied the seat springs too tight. I have to drive with the windows down, my arm hanging out so the door won't rattle. The front window has a new smash in it, the shape of a sunset. I pull up to a light on State Street across from the paper company. When I look over, there's Elizabeth and Mae Mobley and Raleigh, all crammed in the front seat of their white Corvair, headed home from some supper somewhere. I guess. I freeze, not daring to look over again, afraid she'll see me and ask what I'm doing in the truck. I let them drive ahead, watching their taillights, fighting a hotness rising in my throat. It's been a long time since I've talked to Elizabeth. After the toilet incident, Elizabeth and I struggled to stay friends. We still talked on the phone occasionally, but she stopped saying more than a hello and a few empty sentences to me at league meetings because Hilly would go see her. The last time I stopped by Elizabeth's house was a month ago. I can't believe how big May Mobley's gotten, I said. May Mobley had smiled shyly, hid behind her mother's leg. She was taller, but still soft with baby fat. Growing like a weed, Elizabeth said, looking out the window. And I thought, what an odd thing to compare a child to, a weed. Elizabeth was still in her bathrobe, hair rollers in, already tiny again after the pregnancy. Her smile stayed tight. She kept looking at her watch, touching her curlers every few seconds. We stood around the kitchen. 
Want to go to the club for lunch? I asked. Abilene swung through the kitchen door then. In the dining room, I caught a glimpse of silver and Battenberg lace. I can't, and I hate to rush you out, but Mom is meeting me at the Jewel Taylor shop. She shot her eyes out the front window again. You know how Mama hates to wait. Her smile grew exponentially. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't let me keep you. I patted her shoulder and headed for the door, and then it hit me. How could I be so dumb? It's Wednesday, 12 o'clock, my old bridge club. I backed the Cadillac down her drive, sorry that I'd embarrassed her so. When I turned, I saw her face stretched up to the window, watching me leave. And that's when I realized she wasn't embarrassed that she'd made me feel bad. Elizabeth Leifold was embarrassed to be seen with me. I park on Abilene Street, several houses down from hers, knowing we need to be even more cautious than ever. Even though Hilly would never come to this part of town, she is a threat to us all now, and I feel like her eyes are everywhere. I know the glee she would feel catching me doing this. I underestimate how far she would go to make sure I suffered the rest of my life. It's a crisp December night and a fine rain is just starting to fall. Head down, I hurry along the street. My conversation this afternoon with Mrs. Stein is still racing through my head. I've been trying to prioritize everything left to do, but the hardest part is I have to ask Abilene again about what happened to Constantine. I cannot do a just job on Constantine's story if I don't know what happened to her. It defeats the point of the book to put in only part of the story. It wouldn't be telling the truth. I hurry into Abilene's kitchen. The look on my face must tell her something's wrong. What is it? Somebody see you? No, I say, pulling papers from my satchel. I talked to Mrs. Stein this morning. I tell her everything I know about the deadline, about the pile. All right, so Abilene is counting days in her head the same way I have been all afternoon. So we got two and a half weeks instead of six weeks. Oh, law, that ain't enough time. We still got to finish writing the Louvenia section and smooth out Faye Bell and the mini section. It ain't right yet, Miss Skeeter. We ain't got a title yet. I put my head in my hands. I feel like I'm slipping underwater. That's not all, I say. She wants me to write about Constantine. She asked me what happened to her. Abilene sets her cup of tea down. I can't write it if I don't know what happened, Abilene. If you can't tell me, I was wondering if there was someone else who will. Abilene shakes her head. I reckon they is, but I don't want nobody else telling you that story. Then will you? Abilene takes off her black glasses, rubs her eyes, she puts them back on and I expect to see a tired face. She's worked all day and she'll be working even harder now to try to make the deadline. I fidget in my chair waiting for her answer, but she doesn't look tired at all. She's sitting straight up and gives me a defiant nod. I'll write it down. Give me a few days. I'll tell you everything that happened to Constantine. I work for 15 hours straight on Lavinia's interview. On Thursday night, I go to the league meeting. I'm dying to get out of the house, antsy from nerves, jittery about the deadline. The Christmas tree is starting to smell too rich. The spiced oranges sickly decadent. Mother is always cold and my parents' house feels like I'm soaking in a vat of hot butter. I pause on the lead steps, take in a deep breath of clean winter air. It's pathetic, but I'm glad to still have the newsletter. 
once a week, I actually feel like I'm part of things. And who knows, maybe this time will be different with the holidays starting and all. But the minute I walk in, backs turn. My exclusion is tangible, as if concrete walls have formed around me. Hilly gives me a smirk, whips her head around to speak to someone else. I go deeper into the crowd and see Elizabeth. She smiles and I wave. I want to talk to her about mother, tell her I'm getting worried. But before I get too close, Elizabeth turns, head down and walks away. I go to my seat. This is new from her here. Instead of my usual seat up front, I slip in the back row angry that Elizabeth won't even say hello. Beside me is Rachel Cole Brandt. Rachel hardly ever comes to meetings with three kids working on her master's in English from Millsaps College. I wish we were better friends, but I know she's too busy. On my other side is Dan Leslie Fullerbean and her cloud of hairspray. <laughs> She must risk her life every time she lights a cigarette. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I wonder if I pushed the top of her head, would, <laughs> would aerosol spray out of her mouth? <laughs> Almost every girl in the room has her legs crossed, a lit cigarette in her hand. The smoke gathers and curls around the ceiling. I haven't smoked in two months and the smell makes me feel ill. Hilly steps up to the podium and announces the upcoming gimme drives, coat drive, can drive, book drive, and plain old money drive. And then we get to Hilly's favorite part of the meeting, the trouble list. This is where she gets to call out the names of anyone late on their dues or tardy for meetings or not fulfilling their philanthropic duties. I'm always on the trouble list nowadays for something. Hilly's wearing a red wool A-line dress with a cape coat over it, Sherlock Holmes style, even though it's hot as fire in here. Every once in a while, she tosses back the front flap like it's in her way, but she looks like she enjoys this gesture too much for it to really be a problem. Her helper, Mary Nell, stands next to her, handing her notes. Mary Nell has the look of a blonde lap dog, the Pekingese kind with tiny feet and a nose that perks at the end. Now we have something very exciting to discuss. Hilly accepts the notes from the lap dog and scans over them. The committee has decided that our newsletter could use a little updating. I sit up straighter. Shouldn't I decide on changes on the newsletter? First of all, we're changing the newsletter from weekly to monthly. It's just too much with stamps going up six cents and all. And we're adding a fashion column, highlighting some of the best outfits worn by our members and a makeup column with all the latest trends. Oh, and the trouble list, of course. That'll be in there too. She nods her head, making eye contact with a few members. And finally, the most exciting change. We've decided to name this new correspondence the Tattler. After the European magazine, all the ladies over there read. Isn't that the cutest name, says Mary Lou White. And Hilly's so proud of herself, she doesn't even bang the gavel at her for speaking out of turn. Okay, then. It is time to choose an editor for our new Modern Monthly. Any nominations? Several hands pop up. I sit very still. Jeannie Price, what say ye? I say Hilly. I nominate Hilly Holbrook. Aren't you the sweetest thing? All right. Any others? Rachel Cole Brandt turns and looks at me like, are you believing this? Evidently, she's the only one in the room who doesn't know about me and Hilly. Any seconds? Hilly looks down at the podium. She can't quite remember who's been nominated. To Hilly Holbrook as editor? 
I second, I third, bang, goes the gavel. And I've lost my post as editor. Leslie Fullerbean is staring at me with eyes so wide, I can't see there, or I can see there isn't anything back there where her brain should be. Skeeter, isn't that your job? Rachel asks. It was my job. I mutter and head straight for the doors when the meeting is over. No one speaks to me. No one looks me in the eye. I keep my head up high. In the foyer, Hilly and Elizabeth talk. Hilly tucks her dark hair behind her ears, gives me a diplomatic smile. She strides off to chat with someone else, but Elizabeth stays where she is. She touches my arm as I walk out. Hey, Elizabeth, I murmur. I'm sorry, Skeeter, she whispers, and our eyes hang together. But then she looks away. I walk down the steps and into the dark parking lot. I thought she had something more to say to me, but I guess I was wrong. And that is where we're going to stop for now. Sounds like a good stopping spot. Thank you for joining me. Oh, let me uncross my legs. Woo! <laughs> Thank you for joining me for Mrs. Pamry. I hope you have a wonderful day and I will see you next time. Bye.